Welcome to Kicking It Local, the podcast all about the football community in South Australia. I'm your host, Johnny Kecko, and today I am joined by the senior footballer at FK Belgrade in the NPL and also a Vanuatu international, Jared Clark. Mate, thank you for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to chat with you. You're my f- uh, I think you're my first national international footballer that hasn't played for Australia, and uh, it's a pleasure to chat to you and yeah. talk about what it's like playing uh, oceanic football as well. Yeah, for sure. It's... Uh I, I didn't didn't realise that that was the case, but uh, yeah. But you're born and bred in uh, in South Australia. You played in Adelaide for all your junior years. Western Strikers, Adelaide City, White City, and uh, a little bit of times in the under 18s for West Adelaide. What's uh, what was it like um, your junior years of football? Uh, yeah, so my junior years, I started off uh, just just playing school soccer, um, just at uh, Albert and Primary School where I went, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, sort of growing up, I was always in the backyard and, you know, we had a trampoline, but I'm sure most kids, <laughs> yeah. you know, would flip it on the side and uh, use it as goals. Um, so they probably got more use of it. Uh, the <laughs> trampoline was more used uh, as a goal rather than, you know, a trampoline. Um, so, yeah, from there, I was a, I was a quite quite shy, um, sort of a shy footballer when I was... Um, when I first started, uh, you know, the ball would come close yep. and I'd sort of run away. And <laughs> my parents said to me, oh, just, just pretend it's like the backyard. And then from there, I sort of yep. got into that. Um, but yeah, I started off at Western Strikers, uh, which was, yeah, for me, only five minutes down the road. And used to go there, you know, most weekends mm. uh, to watch the seniors, uh, which was great uh, with my dad. Um, uh, and then, yeah. Was football in your family at that point? Uh not, not really. No, my um, my dad did play a little bit in school. Uh, but he was a goalkeeper, but he played yeah a bit, a bit of footy, I believe, as well. Um, but he he played rugby. He actually went over to New Zealand to play rugby, and that's that's actually where my parents met in yep. New Zealand. Um, and then my mum played a little bit of rugby as well. So yeah, I'm not sure as to why um, football was the sport that we got into, but yeah, I think my parents sort of thought oh, this is the best for you know, coordination yep. and, you know, all those sorts of different things. So, yeah, but, yeah, my nonno, he's a a uh, Man United fan uh, yep. and has been for for a long time. He grew up in Scotland and then, yeah, came over when he was, well, he was, I'd say, quite young. But, yep. uh, yeah, in the family, not not, not particularly a yep. football family. So. What's your cultural background? We know Vanuatu, your mum was born there, was it, your mum's side? Uh, yes, yes, her, yeah, her sides all, all yep. from Vanuatu for yeah many generations yeah what about your dad so what background is uh he uh yeah so my dad obviously he's born here uh my nonna was born here but her parents are from uh Italy and yep. they came out uh when she was young as well and then my nonna he's Scottish and he came out as well when he was young and obviously they yeah. met here and yeah that's cool so mixture um of uh, a background for you and uh but now you're playing for Vanuatu which is cool but so that's probably why Western Strikers and Adelaide City might have been a good fit as well. A little bit of Italian background there for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, yeah, I mean, yeah, like you said, a lot of uh, young young kids there that were Italian and I guess just in the football community mm. as well. But yeah, a lot of people now that you still see out at different places that you yeah. still have fond memories with. So And then White City, Serbian uh, background in that, well, now known as FK Belgrade now, and you're there currently, but your junior years, that's where you were, and it led you to another spot uh, in a youth team over in Serbia as well. What was it like playing within White City set up? Uh, Yeah, so at that time, when I did go, I had uh, sort of been in the the Skilaroos and the state state system, uh, and... I think it was yeah the Skillaroos uh, when when you go off to, over to Coffs Harbour yeah and um, I didn't make the squad uh, that that time and then um, yeah there was an opportunity there was like a three week trip to to Serbia um, that was my first taste of you know Europe European football let's say um, at yeah a young age uh, so I did come back and yeah I think it was yeah a couple of years later I went to White City because yeah. By that time, the uh, state team, uh, I think at that point, then it became sort of NTC and they were playing in the 18s. Yep. Um, but I didn't make the squad for that. And then from there, uh, yeah, there was an opportunity at White City to go there. Um, and then, yeah, played 18s and reserves that year. Um, and yeah, that was a great season for, for White City as well because uh, that year, I believe they got to the, 
the cup final. They had you know, some great players. They had Nikola Maluznic, I think Lockie Barr was there as well. Lloyd Owusu, uh, you know, Miki Pekovic as well. Some some great players had a, yeah. had a really good team and it was always great to to watch the night games there, which we'll have more of this year, which is yeah. Yeah, super exciting. So The White City fans are different to, to most other fans, aren't they? They love uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even uh, yeah, last year... Uh, at, at Croydon still and I remember you know now one of my current teammates Andoni he, <laughs> he scored a late goal against us a bit of a deflection but um, yeah it, you know from outside the box hit it and yeah just you know yeah, they've always got so many people there and it's always you know it's such an alive club in that and you know, there's always people from you know young kids to all the older people there that you know all enjoy football and then you know the community aspect of it is you know yep. quite uh Tight knit, tight knit as well. So it is, and they're known for staying up late and drinking a lot. Um, I've seen because it's only it's a local club for me, so I drive past it regularly. I remember once two a.m. in the morning, and they're still out there partying, <laughs> loud music. I don't know how the neighbours do it though. Are you? Uh, do you like try and uh, soak up that scene as well? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely one to to soak it up for sure. Um, you know, it does help. Obviously, I was over overseas in Serbia for a few years, but. Um, yeah, all the music and yeah, you know, the people are all, mm. all very, very nice and accommodating as well. Um, you know, if you if you like to to drink as well, then mm. you know, it doesn't matter if you're Serbian or not, you'll you'll definitely fit in. So yeah, yeah. There was one time I was there for the uh, the Kara Georgiev Cup, the Serbian Cup. All yeah, the Serbian yeah. clubs from around the country all here. And I was coming to commentate, and they gave me a half, literally a half a cup of rakia, which is very strong uh, alcohol, and I. Didn't want to drink it because I had to work. So, <laughs> yeah. but that's what they like. They just want to drink before anything. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. They're very, very social about it. But uh, yeah, always a good time. It is. It is a good time. But over in Serbia, totally different to over here. The, con- the c- club you went and played for, FK Vojvodina, they're one of the most uh, popular clubs over in the, um, in Serbia, as well as the um, third oldest, third oldest football club in t- the Serbian uh, Superliga. You were in a youth setup. What was it like um, during that period for yourself over there? Uh yeah so I mean just just going over there I was 16 um and I think at the time I didn't sort of think oh you know I mean you know you had a lot of players sort of in the golden generation of, mm. of the soccerers that you know did go over to Europe at young ages but I think it's only now when you know you, you look at when or when I look at someone that's 16 and I go oh far out I was I was this age when I went overseas yeah. and I sort of yeah at the time it was just like you know I'm going to you know chase a dream yep. and, and whatnot and develop and and test myself mm. um but yeah over there was yeah really really good um you know went from being 16 to, to 19 over there so you know a boy to, boy to man sort of yep. thing um but yeah the the football there was was really good um yeah had a great time learning soaking up obviously the culture as well um but definitely learned a lot the football there is very technical um still quite physical um maybe not as physical as you'd you'd see in australia but yep. um yeah a lot of emphasis on you know quick ball movement very very tactical as well um and i got to you know train with some you know uh, really high profile players as well and some uh teammates that i had during my youth years there mm. um are now playing for you know serbia under 21s yep uh, you know, some are in the US, some are in Belgium, Holland, this and that. So, um, no, it's, it was a you know invaluable experience, I think. Do you remember some of the names that you played with? Uh, so there is one, Mihailo Ivan- Ivancevic. He's playing in, I think, Odense. And I did get to train, actually, with um, a one guy, Politanovic, uh, who was playing in Belgium as well. Uh, Nemanja Radoja, who was at Celta Vigo, but now he's elsewhere, I believe. But yeah, just some some great players um, that I was able to play with, train with, and, yeah. and compete against. So yeah, really cool. So this whole experience, 16 years old, that's very young. You're only 25 years old. So all the <laughs> things we list off um, and we're going to talk about, you've done all this in a very short period. Um, only 25, played for your national team, played for LA United Youth as well eventually. But you've gone overseas, 16 years old and up until 19. They're very, um, it's a very important age as a footballer, learning a lot during that period. Did you do that all by yourself over there or did you have someone to help you? Or 
Someone uh, guide you? Yeah, so when I did go over, it was with um, Drago, who most people would know yep. in, in the football community. So I was over there staying with his family. And um, yeah, it was yeah through him. And then obviously my parents were were great. They you know supported me and they still do. Yep. Um, but I think it's only now you look back and, you know, yeah, it's a sacrifice for me to go over there and a, and a big step. But, you know, also while I was over there, you know, my dad's here working, mm. you know, discussing hours to, to, you know, to obviously feed the family here, but then also to, to fund my um, football over there. Um, and then obviously my mum as well, um, you know, looking after my two brothers and yeah. sorting them out as well while they're still going through high school. So, yeah, I think for a lot of people and their journey, it's not just, you know, them that has to sacrifice, but, yeah. you know, it's like I say, it takes a, takes a village to... Mm. Uh, I've forgotten the quote now. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I've forgotten it as well. <laughs> Having your family there, I've seen your family, uh, your parents, they look like the very supportive parents. So do you reckon if it wasn't for them to have them by your side, do you reckon you would be in a similar situation as you are now? Uh, no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, I mean, even I remember when I was younger and I used to hate um, like toe tapping the ball yeah. Just because, you know, this was maybe I was eight, nine, oh, maybe not nine. I was maybe seven or eight years old and I just toe tapping. I just wasn't good at it Yep. and I just didn't like it. But my dad was like, no, nah, we're going outside and we're going to, we're going to practice. And, you know, nowadays maybe that's, you know, seen as being too, too pushy. Yep. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes, you know, you can't always stay motivated yourself. And obviously, at a young age, you you know, you'd rather yeah. be doing other things perhaps than than training things that you you don't enjoy. But yeah, like I said, no, nah, there's no way I'd be where I am without my family for sure. So, so no matter what, your dad was always there trying to help you train, get through those areas where you needed to to fix on, work on. Uh, yeah, I mean. It was only probably around those early or yeah. sort of younger years that it was, you know, all the fundamental things like, you know, help practice, you know, we, you know whether that was volleys or, you know, cones or ladder work, whatever it was. Um, you know, we used to always go down to Western Strikers, you yeah. know, kick a ball on the on the weekends, uh, practicing stuff there. But, um, yeah, it was never never a, a sort of a chore for me to, to do it with him. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, it was always good to have someone that would yeah. sort of, you know, push you when you when you didn't want to be pushed. Because um, yeah, I think that's important to to realize, you know, your potential and yeah, and develop further. So, well, while you're over in uh, Serbia, I want to talk a little bit more about that. We see a lot of people that have go over to Europe and go there for a couple of years and struggle to try and um, to find uh, their feet over there. So with while you were over there, you're only in your youth years. Did you plan to try and find a a full-time role over there or was it always a plan to just do your youth years there and maybe eventually come back home uh yeah so when i was over there it was definitely to to give it you know a real real shot and um yeah pick up a contract or something like that um but yeah the the, the timing probably was a little bit unfortunate um sort of when i finished up my youth years and it was sort of the next step was you're either you know training with the first team, yep. and because I was a foreigner, uh, I could only play in the top two leagues. Um, so for then it was now to find a, a club, and you know a lot of the clubs there, even in the first division, so the one under the Superliga, um, you know won't sort of take you unless you've you know played games at you know say second or third division. Yep. And, you know have a bit of a, a resume, you know a bit of you know games behind you. Um, but yeah, at that time there was a new director that came in and sort of had different ideas about how he wanted to to run the club and and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't just for me that the time was unfortunate. It was also unfortunate for players that had you know been there since they were you know six seven years old, mm. all the way up you know ten plus years. Um, and, you know, developed into really good players that had to sort of you know find out the hard way, I guess that or well, the harsh reality of of football. Mm. So, um, but yeah, even though nothing um came of it in terms of a professional contract i think for you know like you said from going there at 16 to 19 um you know just learn a lot like i've got friends over there that i still keep in touch with yeah um you know went went to many trips around um europe with like the school that i was at um and yeah learned the language 
you know obviously embrace the culture as well mm. so yeah just as a whole it was an experience that at a young age to have is you know quite eye-opening so what are some of the areas you think that has very much helped you with the way you play football today um that's helped you during that period there from playing over there in serbia uh well i think the biggest thing over there was you know the tactical uh, side of the game obviously the, the technical side as well was was really really good um and that definitely sharpened me up i think i think also um just composure and being composed on the yep. ball was something um you know that these players had um you know the ball was moving quick and there's a lot of pressing and that but you know there was never a time really you know when these professional players would be on the ball and really be sort of stressing out about you know the next pass or anything because you know they're obviously prepared before that they're scanning that they're you know making space making mm -hmm. the right moves um so yeah but other than that it was yeah i went over as a as a center mid i'd, I'd played um as a six like for most of my life and then there was yeah a couple of games where we didn't have any center backs because you know the three of them or four were, were injured um so then i went into center back and yeah they i sort of stayed as a center back there and then since yeah coming back i've stayed at center back so would you ever want to move up to center mid again or would you like uh, being at the back <laughs> uh, I, I do enjoy being at the back um it's yeah it's taken a bit of time to sort of grow into a uh maybe a bit more of a like a leadership role obviously because at the back you can see everything um so that's definitely something that i'm i want to improve on but um yeah there's always times when you know you might be driving into yeah into the middle of the park and you know get past the the press and then you step in and you know then you start to think oh you know maybe i can <laughs> go back to being a six or whatever and, and and playing you know balls wide and whatnot and through the lines but uh no i do enjoy playing center back so For, and before we head back to the, uh, your time when you came back to australia so a lot of people we see a lot of kids trying to go to europe or want to go to europe and um what do you, what would you say is one of the hardest things about going in and you something you'd probably tell someone or if it was need to tell yourself again before going over there that you need to be aware of or take note of before going over there to prepare yourself the most for the experience uh, well when i when i first got there uh you know grabbed my bags from you know the airport yeah went to the, the to the house and as soon as i got in the room i put my bags down and my first thought was what am I doing here? Because I was just, it was such a culture shock. Yeah. Um, and then probably for the first maybe week, I was, you know, pretty homesick. Um, but I think probably the the one thing I'd say to prepare would be to understand that, yeah, there'll be times when, you know, you'll miss your family or, you know, you think, you know, like I did when I first got there, like, what am I doing here? But I think you just have to be patient with yourself and not, um, not put too much pressure yep. to sort of adapt because you know going from maybe you know maybe in Europe it's different if you go from one country to another there are more similarities but yep. you know going from Australia to Europe it's um, yeah a bigger difference um, so the biggest thing I'd, I'd I'd say to anyone would yeah just to be patient and give yourself a a good shot um, you know in, in terms of of time and to not call it too early that you come back and yep. if you can stay longer that you sort of do that because you know you never know what's around the corner and, mm. and what you can learn and and things like that so what was the food like over there very good very good <laughs> very good i yeah I, in, I really enjoyed the food um where i was staying well I, yeah where i was staying in the village everyone had you know a lot of livestock um and everyone would you know make their own you know cure their own meats yep. and make their own um pickled goods and things like that um so yeah i mean when i went over i was, I was really skinny but <laughs> you know all the food and yeah i was training as well so i wasn't you know putting on weight in terms that i was you know getting yeah too fat or anything like that but um yeah i think from then i was able to put on some size and <laughs> and not be so skinny so yeah that was that was good that would have been um oh, that would have been a drink for me I, I don't know if i could do the football but i definitely could do the <laughs> eating that's for sure um and then the language is that easy to pick up because uh, it's, it's an interesting language isn't it yeah yeah well i luckily for me i will I was over there on a student visa, um, so I had to renew that every year because I went over it. Well, I was the mi middle of year 11 when yep. I went over. But their school obviously starts in the middle of the year, so I think their school was maybe half a year after our, yep. ours started. So I had yeah a couple of friends 
in my class that spoke, uh, you know, really good English. Um, so they, they helped me right at the start in, you know, having friends. Um, and they were probably the two closest friends that I had had over there. You know, every uh, every weekend we'd go over, we'd play cards, you know, we'd ride, yeah. ride the bike together, uh, catch up and things like that. But um, it probably took me about maybe six months to, or yeah, about six months to to be able to, you know, go out by myself and I could, you know, hold a conversation and, and you know, if I needed anything, I could ask yeah. and things like that. But, um, yeah, I think just being somewhere where they only speak Serbian or any language, um, you would definitely pick it up a lot yeah. quicker than, you know, if you're, you know, just going to a, to a um, you know, language class, you know, once or twice a week and then yeah. speaking your native tongue the rest of the time. So, yeah. Uh, well, you ended up coming back home at the age of 19. LA United was your next uh, stop, played in the NPL for a few years for them. How did you find um, that experience and how did that come about as well? Uh, so, the way that came about was um, I had, I actually, I had Paul Pezos as a coach uh, under 12s, yeah. oh sorry, under 13s I believe or 14s at Adelaide City um, and then when I had my brief stint at West Adelaide mm-hmm. under 18s, he was also the coach there. Um, and at the time he was the reserves coach at uh, Adelaide United and then he was transitioning to um, become the uh, you know the senior MPL coach for, yep. for Adelaide United so um, yeah there were trials held that year and he said come out I trained with the reserves a little bit because I were at the back end of their season when I came back and then trialed and yeah got in uh, so yeah but it was yeah really good experience it was good you know being involved in that because you know, obviously the last few years have been affected by COVID, but the NYL season over the summer was always really good to, to travel with the team and, you know, play games interstate and things like yeah. that. But, uh, yeah. How do you find a national youth league? Because it's not around at the moment. There's talks and it might come back. We're not 100% certain. But what was it like um, to travel with that team and play against the, the youth teams of other A-League clubs? Yeah, it was, it was really good. Like, uh, yeah, I think... You know, regardless that it was, you know, always really hot at the times that we were playing, it was, yeah, a great experience to go and, you know, you have bonds with, um, you know, your teammates more, obviously, because mm. you're spending more time with them and things like that. But, uh, yeah, we when I was, when the NYL um, was around that I was involved in, it was the two groups and then the, yep. the, the winner of uh, each group would then play the final. Um, and I was spoken to a few other older boys that had it when it was, you know, a real NYL season that you played against every team and, and twice and, and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was a great experience to, to be able to be a part of that. That time, they, to, Paul Pezos was your uh, coach in that period. Everyone that's had Paul Pezos seems to just love um, being coached by him. How do you find his coaching style and um, the way you played under him? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as you can see with Pez, there's you know, almost guaranteed results wherever he goes. Um, in our first year with the youth team, we were the first team to make the um, the finals, which was a great achievement. And we, yeah, beat Comets, I think, three times that year. And um, then we lost to Metro in, I think, the... Oh, it was the second final that we, we lost to him. But, um, yeah, Pez is ta- tactically an in- incredible coach. You know, you have, you know, three different formations that you can play depending on you know press or personnel or mm-hmm. things like that um you know very tough coach as probably everyone else says as well but you know he's always always trying to test you and and improve you you know everyone yeah like i said everyone that's had him mm. enjoys having him um because you know you get pushed to a to a level that you know you might not have uh, been pushed to if if not for him so yeah during this time your current coach now uh, Josh Smith was at the club, assistant coach, also um, had some experience over in Vanuatu as well in their setup in the futsal and um, national teams. So what was it like being with uh, him back then and meeting him and what was his uh, he, he like being around the club? Uh, yeah, Josh, is, Josh has always been uh, very good, I think, in contrast uh, to Pez, just in terms of, uh, you know, maybe communicating um or oh, not even communicating i think it's different yeah, styles. josh is just as, yeah. yeah just a different character they're both you know very f- full-on um into football um and they're both really really well prepared um 
you know, tactically both very good coaches. Um, so, you know, it was good to have, have both of them at the time. But I think, um, yeah, in terms of their uh, personality, perhaps, it was, yeah, a little bit different. But, um, yeah, they were really, really good together. And, yeah, Josh has learned a lot from, from Pez um, and, yeah, plenty of other coaches that, yeah. he's, that he's been under. Um, Central Coast as well. Like I said, Vanuati, I think he was under... Michael Valcanis as well. Um, so yeah, he's got uh, quite a good sort of resume of coaches that he's worked with. So, was there any uh, opportunities to try and make the A League for yourself? Uh, there, uh, well, there was a time that I was training um, with the first team full time. Uh, it was my first year of uni, but uh, Taylor Egan had just left to go overseas. Yep, and um, yeah, at the time I was you know one of the center backs there and yeah got to train like i said full time with them this was under marco kurz yeah i quite enjoyed you know his style of coaching him and uh and philip and yeah there was one game actually i think against sydney that uh isais played center back that game i think it was away as well that they played but i thought oh yeah maybe i might you know even sit on the bench that time but it was only at the end of the season um when all the first team players went to um get their shirts and things like that um, and Carlo sent a photo, uh, Armiento sent a photo and he said, oh, Jad, I'll grab this shirt and bring it for you. And it was, you know, Clark, you know, had a number on there and they'd actually printed one yep. just in case I had to. So, um, which I didn't actually know that I was maybe close to sitting on the bench. But yeah, after that, then he came in, Verbeek, Verbeek, I think. Um, and then from there it was, yes, it was you yeah. know, for me, I was, you know, a bit older at the time in terms of the rest of the boys. But yeah, that's as, as close as I got to, to A-League, so... Kurtz was a, um, a great coach. There's a lot of uh, talk of what he was like. Um, he was treated the players really well. But um, Verbeek was a different type of coach. Didn't last too long at uh, LA United. But do you reckon if Kurtz was there for another season, you may have um, been able to get another shot, maybe? Potentially? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, that it might have been, been on the cards. Yeah, I mean, I felt like I had a pretty good relationship with with uh, actually his assistant, um, Philip, um, in training. He was, you know, always... Mm. you know directing me and you know giving me instruction on you know how I should move when to play uh passes and you know reading the yeah. you know, body language of the attackers and things like that so well you never played though but do you still have that jersey uh I do yeah yeah, yeah it's actually yeah it's at, at my uh, in my room yeah just hanging up so yeah yeah, I'd be putting that right in the uh, the middle of the room so everyone <laughs> can see it. <laughs> Even though you didn't play, and it's still cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. To have one, but hopefully one day you'll be able to um, to get to that point uh, and still have that opportunity. He plays a locky bar. Does that also add a bit of um, uh, an extra like motivation to try and make it? Cause seeing locky bar a bit later in his twenties uh, to to make get the opportunity playing for LA United. Now he's a, a first team player. Um, he's playing very good football. Does that give motivation to someone like you so that it can still happen? Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Like you said, yeah, Lockie Barr has yeah been a great player for an, a number of years. You know, mm. like I said, he was at at White City when I was you know only fifteen. He was a great player then. But even yeah, players like yeah Lockie Barr obviously, and then even Maluznic, mm. Um, You know, there is you know definitely opportunity for uh, players from the MPL to you know to get a um get a contract you know you had josh murray as well dom casanzo so you know a, a good season or two will you know definitely catch the eye um but yeah that's something for sure that you're you're working towards as well i've seen a photo um of you playing for la united npl you're only like 19 i think but you um you look a lot more mature than what you are you look a lot older um as a person is that <laughs> had jerry um uh, notice that you would look a bit more mature than uh, the rest of the team uh, well, I think yeah, mature is probably a nice way to put it. But um, yeah, um, yeah, for people that maybe don't know me, I'm, you know, I'd say half of my hair is now quite grey. Um, yeah, started getting my first grey hairs at, at about thirteen, um, but doing better than my dad because th- he told me that by twenty one he was sort of oh, really? all grey. So yeah, I'm I'm you know still ahead of him at the moment. But yeah, it won't be too long until I'm yeah donning the. Silver Fox look. So. <laughs> <laughs> did it ever confuse people seeing you? you? You did look a bit old. You look like you're in your early 20s um, at that, or maybe late mid 20s, <laughs> and you're only 19. Did that confuse some uh, of your teammates? Uh, 
Yeah, well, a lot of the times, you know, you had people that were, you know, you'd hear from the sidelines, you'd be playing and, you know, people would be, you know, asking, oh, how, how old's this guy? You know, is he, you know, is he coming back from injuries? Is he a first team player that's, you know, maybe dropping down? Um, so that was always, always quite funny to say, oh, I'm only 19 sort of thing at that, at, uh, at that time. So, yeah. <laughs> During that time, Josh Smith also was uh, very influential in you getting your Vanuatu um, opportunity being seen. Um, so how did that come about with Josh Smith and linking you up to the Vanuatu team? Uh, yeah, so there was, uh, yeah, so this was back at, at United. Um, it was after, after one of the games and my parents were talking to him. Um, yeah, and Josh sort of just asked my mum, oh, so whereabouts are you from? And she said, oh, Vanuatu. And, you know, by then he, he was like, oh, yeah, because he, um, you know, he has a lot to do with, with Vanuatu. He um, had his wedding over there. His parents had been going for a while, I think, as well, when he was a younger lad. He, you know, would go over every now and again as well. Um, but, yeah, he was involved uh, with the futsal um, and the national team too a little bit. Um, so, yeah, he sort of sent some clips over and, and let them know that there was, you know, mm. an eligible player, um, you know, playing at that time at uh, Adelaide United. But, um, yeah, from there, it was obviously a bit delayed as well because of COVID. Um, but it was, yeah, definitely well worth the wait. And, yeah, a, you know, quite a proud moment for, for myself, but then my family also here in Australia and then, and you know, back back home in Vanuatu. So. Before that point, would it... Did you ever think you could play for Vanuatu or was it always, were you trying to get to Australia and play for the Socceroos? Uh, yeah, well, never sort of, never had it, yeah, in my mind to to play for, for Vanuatu. Um, you know, everyone back home was always, you know, saying, oh, you know, we've got yeah. to get you your passport and, and sort you out. But um, it was only because recently they allowed the um, dual citizenship. Mm. Um, so obviously now I can hold both. Uh, whereas, you know, when I was a bit younger, probably, uh, it was, you know, if I wanted to have the Vanuatu citizenship, I had to get rid of my Australian citizenship. And I think, you know, as a logistics uh, sort of thing, it yeah, didn't make sense to, to give that up, you know, if you're working mm. or, you know, studying and things like that. Unfortunately, the, um, yeah, the, the OFC Nation Cups was cancelled due to COVID-19, but you did go over to Qatar um, eventually for the World Cup uh, qualifications. What was the experience like for you to go over there and experience national, uh, international football? Uh, it was yeah a really really cool experience. Um, I actually was just getting some memories the other um, the other day because yeah this time last year I was in I was in Qatar, but um, yeah it was it was really cool. Um, you know we were staying at you know this really really nice hotel and where we were training as well were um, you know we went out to the pitch mm. and you know the, the the guys were saying that uh, you know when the World Cup starts. <clears throat> that um you know Holland would be training at at this venue and and things like that but yeah it was it was great just to to meet all the boys there cuz cuz of covid I wasn't able to get over, get over to Vanuatu because of flights and things yeah. like that um so it was good to meet all the boys and and things like that so this is in 2021 or 2022 sorry. uh yeah just last year yeah yeah last year yeah. so 2022 and you just would have met uh Brian Kautak then as well who has now made a name for himself in the A league um what was it like uh, to meet him um, as a as a, one of your teammates in the national team? Uh, yeah, it was really good. Um, you know, he's one of the names that I knew before before heading over. Um, you know, him and Mitch Cooper were probably the two that uh, were sort of standouts um, in terms of you know, of personnel. But um, yeah, for people that have you know either watched or, or played with Brian at at um, Belgrade. Um, you know, he's just a, just a monster. Mm. Um, you know, he's very, very experienced, um, played a lot of time in, over in, in Auckland city and with the, uh, OFC champions league as well. Um, but yeah, the ball speed that he has is, you know, crazy. He's got one of the strongest headers that I've, that I've seen. Um, you know, he's, he can hit diags right or left foot. Um, very composed player, very fast, strong, athletic. So yeah. Really well, during great. during that time while you were over there, they were filming a documentary, uh, FIFA were, and I think uh, Brian was featured in that um, heavily. You I think you made a couple of uh, um, 
appearances in there as well. What was it like having a, a film crew around you guys during uh, the time? Yeah, at the at the start, it was it was something to get to get used to because um, yeah, they were they you know be following us everywhere, whether it was training, yeah. meals, you know, in the bus, uh, games, whatever. They they were there, sort of thing, um, following us. Um, so at the start, yeah, it was a bit of a you know, it took a bit of getting used to, but by the end, you know, you sort of were able to just, you know, do your own thing and, and not worry too much about, about the cameras. But, uh, yeah, it was really cool to see it on, on Netflix and, yeah, like you said, a couple of cameos here and there, but, yeah. Because <laughs> um, that was the first time you ever made an appearance for Vanuatu. You made two appearances now. Um, did it add extra pressure having cameras around you or did you just try and switch off and maybe help you with it? Uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't, you know, phase me too much. Um I think yeah. By the time we we'd play the games, they'd been following for a bit, so it was yeah. like I said, you sort of got got used to it. But um, yeah, it was still yeah, very cool. Check out the doco on Netflix because it's going to be um, it's, it's good fun to try and spot you out, <laughs> and spot uh, Brian out as well. He's a great player, and a lot of people in um, in uh, the A League, the fans that didn't know who he was, were lucky we saw him for a couple of games here in Adelaide while he was um, getting to full fitness to go over to Central Coast. There's there's some people saying he's the best uh, signing this season in the A League. Would you agree with that? Uh, oh, I think yeah. Obviously, I'm a bit biased uh, <laughs> to my fellow countrymen, but uh, I think yeah, he's you know he had a bit of a bit of a shaky start at the start, um, you know, of, of the season. I think maybe just getting used to the teammates and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's not a doubt that he, you know, is ready for this level. Yeah. Um, you know, he's just been waiting for his chance. <clears throat> Um, but I think yeah, now you can see he's, you know, a key key player for the for the Mariners. Um, you know, and I think only a few rounds ago he was maybe sitting fifth in the um, Alex Tobin Awards. So he's had you know a lot of you know really standout performances, um, which has been great. Mm. He um, definitely is. But for yourself personally, I want to talk about just when you made your first appearance for Vanuatu. What was the like the emotions for you to to go and finally realize you're representing your country? Uh, yeah, it was it was really really nice um, to do that. Very proud moment, like I said, for for my family here and then also in, in Vanuatu. Um, but yeah, at the time, you know, maybe you don't think about it too much, and maybe maybe I won't for another ten years until you know mm. I've, I've finished playing. Um, but I think it wasn't until. Uh, my family over in Vanuatu didn't actually know that um, I'd been selected for the national team because obviously they they tell you first and then they'll yeah. um, you know show or on the news they'll um, sort of give everyone the the team and who's in it and things like that. Um, so a lot a lot well, sorry all of my family over there um, saw it on on live tv so it was like a big shock for them you know during the game or just before the game uh oh no this was uh before we actually went over to guitar yeah. you know they said oh this is the team that will be representing us uh for the world cup qualifiers and yeah nobody knew and uh you know they heard it come off <laughs> heard my name on tv and then yeah you know my mum was getting phone calls from the family oh you know we're not going to be able to sleep tonight because we're that excited and things like that Fantastic. so yeah it wasn't until then and then you had people messaging me on facebook you know just um yeah you know people from vanuatu saying oh good luck all the best you know it's fantastic and things like that so yeah you don't sort of realize until then and you know i haven't been been back to vanuatu um since so you know who knows what it'll be like when i'm there as well <laughs> yeah so seem very supportive over there what was your mum like that once you um Seeing you, your son, I know how supportive she is here in Adelaide, but what was it like seeing you in that in those colours? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very proud um, for sure. Um, Do you ever speak to her before or after the game? Uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I, I did speak to, yeah, I'm sure I spoke to my parents before and after the game. Um, but yeah, they were, yeah, just really, really stoked. That yeah. I'd been able to, you know, have an, uh, an international appearance for Vanuatu. So it was, yeah, just a lot of pride, I think. Now, there's a lot of links now. This uh, It's interesting that you're you're here in um, Adelaide. You play for Vanuatu. We've seen Brian Kautek, Vanuatu International. There's a couple of others playing in the State League 2 from Vanuatu as well. 
Um, and now your teammate, you're now at FK Belgrade this season. You came from Croydon FC last year. But at um, Belgrade, you also signed the captain of the uh, Solomon Islands national team who came runners-up against New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Um, so very close to getting that half a spot to the mm. World Cup. What's it like now having these um, people from Oceania playing here in Adelaide? Because there seems to be a lot uh, coming here to play. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's good for, I think for, for both parties. I think... You know, Oceania football has a lot, lot to offer. Um, I think maybe the, the pathway isn't quite there yet to, mm. to you know, f- to have a lot of players come over and transition. Um, but you know, Brian being a, you know great example um, of you know players from Oceania that come over and, and do well, and then you know he's got his chance and he's you know taken it, you know, with with two hands. Um, so I think um, you know it's it's nice to see. Um, you know, people from Oceania, like you said, um, coming over and playing. Because mm. um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of talent over there. It's just maybe the the pathway to, you know, professional football isn't, you know, as as, as big as it could be. But, um, you know, in time, hopefully that can, yeah, just, just become better. And, we'll, you know, we'll see more players like Brian. Yeah. Has, is there talk between, do you talk much with the other teammates you played in, in the national team? Is there talk of them? Wanting to come to Australia, or uh, yeah, there are a few that that are definitely keen on on coming over. Um, I do believe the Vanuatu Football Federation now has um, links with teams over in in Brisbane, even uh, Melbourne as well. Um, so there's definitely yeah opportunity for these players to, to yeah. come across. Um, so yeah, and a lot of them come over and and work as um, you know seasonal workers too. Yep. Um, because yeah, they're all quite quite skilled at it um so yeah that's good for them that they can come over and, and work and then also play football too so it'd be great for the league as well to get players like that playing here um and then with the new format of the world cup we never know we might have um uh, a world cup player playing in the npl yeah 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 that's right that's right <laughs> you never know it's up to 48 teams in mm. the next one so who knows that'll be interesting to see um and great promotion for the league as well yeah we can definitely get there. definitely um but the um, you're now there. You see, Josh Smith. We spoke about briefly before how he's got a bit of influence with uh, Vanuatu. He's now the head coach in his first season at uh, FK Belgrade. Was it a natural fit for you to move over um, and join him back there at your old club and your a coach you're familiar with? Um, uh, there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think yeah, like you said, a lot of things sort of uh, align nicely. Um, you know, for me to to move back to to Belgrade. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been quite good under Josh. He's a great great communicator. Like I said before, tactically he's he's very very good, very organised. Um, you know, knows how to you know work with players um, and things like that. So yeah, it's been been good so far. With um, but before you led to this point, now you played a few years at um, Croydon FC between your time at LA United and now FK Belgrade. You st- moved over under jo- um, Angelo Costanzo, then it phased into Travis Dodd um, being the head coach as well. There, what's uh, what was your time like at, at Croydon? Uh, yeah, very good, very good. I, I really enjoyed uh, my time at Croydon. Um, oh, when I first, you know, moved over, um, was because of um, Ange, uh, you know, being a you know very very good defender, um, and I felt like you know that was uh, you know would be be a great move for me. Yeah, um, learn a lot under him. Um, but yeah, Croydon is a you know very good club. Uh, you know the boys there are, are really good. Uh, have a lot of great memories with them. You know both on and off the pitch. Um, and then yeah, under Travis as well, he's um, you know him, you know quite similar to Josh had, had stepped into his first sort of senior mm. head coach role. Um, you know he's he's done well so far. Um, yeah, we made finals last year, which was which was good. Um, and I think. You know the they've got a lot of good young players coming through, and yeah, they're still um, really a team that you need to look out for. So this season, I did a prediction on where I think clubs are going to finish at the end of the year. First time I've done that with the NPL. Um, I'm normally completely wrong, but I put you guys up in the top four um, prediction for the end of the season, and I've also put a long term that next season could be the year of your club uh, FK Belgrade doing something special, but. In your eyes, how do you feel the the club is positioned for the future? Uh, yeah, so I think yeah, under Josh and with the 
the players that we do have it is you know quite a young team um and this was only something i realized when uh you know we had to send our date of birth through um and there's only a handful of players that are born actually before 2000. Oh, wow. Um, which was quite a shock to me. And I was sort of sitting in the office and I was looking, I was like, you know, 2003, four, five, you know, it's, you know, then you start to feel a bit old. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, we we haven't had, you know, the start that we would have wanted, um, you know, conceding, you know, six goals in our last two games. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's still early days. Um, like I said, we've got a young squad as well. Um, so I think, you know, within the next, you know, few rounds, once we start to sort of um, get into the groove of things um, and sort of pick up some form and, and get onto a good run, I think we will yeah, mm. do all right this season. But yeah. Your first win of the season was uh, Metro Stars away, round two, um, last minute winner. Um, incredible uh, way to finish the game off with uh, Josh Murray scoring that goal. Afterwards, I was sticking around um, and I could hear how loud you guys were singing. It was went on for about at least, at least 10 minutes, I reckon, um, song after song. But what did, it, what did it mean to you guys to, to get that first win of the season? I'm not, I'll, like, we know that now that there's been a few losses since that, but to get that first win as a club, was it, what made it so special? Uh, well, I think, yeah, like I said, it was the, it was the first win. Um, you know, for Josh as well, it's his first competitive win as head coach. And then for this group of players, it's our, it was our first, you know, proper win. Um, you know, I think, you know, Metro are definitely one of the contenders uh, for this season. And I think, you know, even though we've yeah lost the last couple of games, yeah. um, you know, a result against Metro like that. And then, you know, we know that we can can be competitive um so yeah it's just about you know big moments and you know little details in big moments that yeah. you know we need to we need to get right but um yeah i think every win at um at you know belgrad will be big and mm. you know hopefully we can uh have many memorable home wins as well um uh, with the fans there as well so yeah how how much are you looking forward to as a player playing at um at Frank Mitchell Park at night time under lights now? It's gonna be able to play um under lights there. We know the crowd comes out and they absolutely enjoy the football there. What's uh what's gonna be like for you to be able to play in front of them? Uh I'm I'm really excited because um when I was at um White City before, um, you know, I used to love watching the night games and like you said, there's always a always a big crowd and as I said before, it's a very live club. You yeah. know, you've got people from all all ages, and you know, people that maybe don't come for the football, but more for the for the food and the community aspect of it. Um, you know, it always creates a really nice atmosphere, and it's yeah, really something special to be a part of. So, so get down to uh, FK Belgrade's home ground, Frank Mitchell Park, if you can, uh, to watch you guys on a on a um, a nighttime game will be cool. I, I live around the corner, so if I'm not commentating another game, or <laughs> I'm going to be down there for a chivap maybe, and uh, I look forward to that. And <laughs> yeah, ma- no doubt, maybe a rack here as well. A shot, yeah, with- yeah, one or two. <laughs> yeah, why not with you guys? Um, but looking forward to to getting down to the club for that, and looking forward to seeing what you do with your international football as well. Hopefully, you can get a few more games in you, and uh, hopefully a competitive match because those two you play were friendlies. But there's only more to come. Um, hopefully for you in that aspect because you're only 25 years old even though you may look a bit older yeah, <laughs> but um, you're only 25 years old so you've got a long way to go in your in your career so all the best mate with your future but before i let you go we've got to do the kick in the questions uh, which i think you're across um potentially have you thought about these or have you heard about these kicking the questions before uh i have heard them but it's it, i haven't actually listened to um one of the player podcasts in a while so i've got no idea what I'm all what right I'm beautiful for. this is what i like i absolutely like this bit because now you can uh, give me an answer off the cuff so which footballer would you love to kick it with on the park anyone in the world if you had the opportunity to who would you love to kick it with uh now for me it would be andrea pirlo because i used to just love watching him play and like i said when i grew up i was i was you know a six um and he was someone that i really enjoyed um enjoyed watching so it'd have yeah. to be him yeah nice well I was thinking, you. Uh, I heard a rumour that you're an Arsenal, massive Arsenal fan, which yes, is very yes. rare in Adelaide. There's not many of those around, but um, <laughs> I've had about 10 of them on my podcast already. I can't yeah. believe it. Um, but w- would there be anyone from Arsenal you would love to kick with as well? 
Uh, I think current players, it would probably be um, either Saka or Erdegaard. Nice. Sure. Do you hang around with some of the Arsenal fans here in Adelaide? Do you go out to watch games with them as well? Uh, I haven't actually been to a venue with, um, you know, with Arsenal fans. Um, but yeah, there's still plenty of big games left this season. So yeah. Sure, later I'm, in the I'm season. The way you guys are going, maybe uh, later in the season, you guys will be out every game, I reckon. Hopefully, but yes. <laughs> there's a few out there. Matt Mays, Mark Talbot, and uh, yeah, Tony yeah. Spagonis. There's heaps. Don't realise. I never thought uh, there was many, but they're all coming out of the woodwork yeah. this year. <laughs> they definitely are. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the second one is name two people you love to kick it with. Uh, anyone in the world, an international f- um, footballer and also someone locally as well. And on a Saturday night and watching football. So who would you love to kick it with? All right. I think... So I got to pick two people. Yeah, two. You can you can bend the rules a little bit. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, all right. So international footballer. Yep. Anyone from it in internationally? Oh wow. Could be anyone. Yeah, maybe I should have maybe studied this before. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, this is a bit more organic now. Yeah. I'm having to having to think. It's good though. I like this. Um, could be anyone. Could be Pure Pier- Low again. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll go with him again. Yeah. Him and then. I reckon... He'll be fun. Who's local that you would love to to kick it with? Anyone. I think... Well, in your club as well, I think Andoni will be a lot of fun to party with. In my club? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. I already already spend too much time with him. Because he coaches the under sevens as well. So, um, yeah. He's always out partying. I see that guy every day, yeah. (laughs) I saw him at a Greek festival once. He was out there partying, (laughs) working and doing everything. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, probably at the moment it'd be, yeah, probably Andoni. Yeah. (laughs) Is there anyone else as well? You... Pick or do you just want to go with Andoni? Uh, maybe and Andoni and then um, <laughs> Damian Ljuic. Okay. Yeah, another another young player in in um in my team. But yeah, the three of us are always you know always together. Um, so yeah, probably probably those. Andoni two. and then Ljuic and also you got uh, Andrea Perlo as well. So there you yeah. Go. That's a good mix. <laughs> and a few Araki. I reckon you go through a few bottles of Araki. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. potentially. Yeah, yeah potentially. <laughs> uh, but all the best, mate. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure chatting to you and getting to know your story uh, in Australia, overseas, for Vanuatu and also in uh, Serbia as well. It's been uh, interesting and look forward to seeing you uh, playing more football in the NPO and, and, and abroad as well. No worries. Thanks again for having me, Johnny. And uh, yeah, it's great to have these uh, different player podcasts and, and hear people's stories. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate your time. That was Jared Clark from FK Belgrade and Vanuatu's national football team. Make sure you subscribe to Kicking It Local wherever you get your podcasts so you can get a taste of the SA football community. Plus, follow at Kicking It Local SA on Instagram and Twitter so you don't miss any of the action. See you soon.